वेलकम टू दिस एपिसोड ऑफ यूरेका एंटी एजिंग ड्रग परैप्स टॉक्सिक फ्री इंसेक्टिसाइड एंड मे बी मोर पोर्टेंट कैंसर ड्रग्स दीज आर द वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग एरिया दैट आवर गेस्ट टुडे इज वर्किंग ऑन प्रोफेसर संतानु भट्टाचार्य हु इज द डायरेक्टर ऑफ इंडियन एसोसिएशन फॉर कल्टिवेशन ऑफ साइंस हियर इन कलकत्ता थैंक यू सर थैंक्स फॉर बींग विथ अस बिफोर वी कंटिन्यू दिस डिस्कशन एंड दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन Let's take a quick look at his brief profile and we'll continue this conversation. Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya is a unique scientist who works at the interface of chemistry, biology and material science. Presently, he is the director at Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science in Kolkata. Simultaneously, he is also a professor in the Department of Organic Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Science. and an honorary professor of chemical biology in JNCASR Bangalore Professor Shantanu obtained his PhD from Rutgers University New Brunswick in US then he had a 3 year postdoctoral stint at Massachusetts Institute of Technology under the guidance of Nobel laureate Professor H Gobind Khurana His research interest lies in the cross disciplines of biology and chemistry and he is also actively involved in the area of supra molecular chemistry molecular sensors soft materials self assemblies chemical biology and nano science Professor Bhattacharya carried out several and diverse projects which include DNA binding of new molecules for the design of novel anti cancer agents and he is currently working on a gel that can be used in pesticide free agriculture apart from this professor bhattacharya received numerous awards and honors noted among them is the twas international prize in chemistry ranbaxy award in pharmaceutical sciences and the ssb award for his contributions to chemical sciences thank you thank you for being with us uh, it's a very wonderful uh, experience visiting your uh, oldest institute in some sense of science institutes uh, in oldest india. institution of its kind in india in india started its journey in 1876 1876 it's a, one of the really old institutions uh, That's right, we right. are sitting and then uh, so called the bengal renaissance period where the awakening in this part of the country took place that we must do everything ourselves and dr mahendra lal sarkar who was the second md of calcutta medical college he spearheaded this campaign personally and founded this institute after being blessed by many including the renowned sage ramakrishna paramahansa dev and also you know rishi bankim chandra chattopadhyay and many of his contemporaries also encouraged him with personal philanthropy and donations that's how he started see one thing this institution the moment you say the name of this institution that immediately comes is the one and only nobel prize for physics of a indian working in india that's right yeah c v raman c v raman's nobel prize winning experiment perhaps was done in this institute that's what i am told you know c v raman came in 1907 to india calcutta in to calcutta and you know he came here after topping the indian finance exam mm mm-hmm. but i think he so, soon realized that this is not his cup of tea and he started finding out opportunities to do some research beyond office hours mm. and sir asutosh mukherjee that time the then vice chancellor of the university of calcutta offered him an opportunity and so he was given a laboratory where he started working and i think indian association for the cultivation of science where he worked in the in the field of optics uh, he was working in field of sound of physics as well but i think in optics he made this discovery of raman effect in fact he announced this discovery of raman effect on 28 february 1928 and we now know rest is folklore uh, and uh, raman effect the day, date on which it is discovered is celebrated throughout the country Uh, as the national science day yeah the national science day in india we celebrate on every february 28 right which is not raman's birthday but the date on which raman actually discovered what later came to be known as the raman effect right that's a that's a interesting point 
in addition to raman if you look at uh, all the founding fathers of indian science they have somewhere other association with this institute right most of them you know you have uh, professor asen bose he was a national research professor here and meghnath shah he was actually the first official director of indian association for the cultivation of science and you know that both of these names you know they have done very fundamental contributions in physics for which you know their names have been recommended for nobel prize in fact uh, one uh, history of uh, i mean historian of astronomy says that before saha there was astronomy there was physics it's only after saha you have astrophysics right he says that in some sense one should acknowledge that saha is the founder of astrophysics that's a very interesting point absolutely uh, in addition to all these people even k s krishnan was associated with this institution k s krishnan actually who performed this experiment in raman laboratory so he was actually very much associated with the discovery of raman effect so he was a great man and uh, he did his phd here uh, under the tutelage of sir c v raman and uh, you know he went to national physical laboratory uh, yeah and he established the whole uh, setup of the physical laboratory uh, exactly then even today it is one of the most performing institute if you actually go by the recent survey of nature in uh, per capita publication and the impact of work it is among the best in the country okay so it's been that even if the institute is 1876 that old yeah. even today it's vibrant and young absolutely and we have very high quality faculty members and students who are still doing highly you know contemporary work in frontier research areas of high significance and we have very high international visibility very interesting what kind of major areas this institute is uh, working on well right now we are working on fundamental sciences of chemistry physics and biology but lot of current emphasis is on interdisciplinarity because you know as you look at most of the you know frontier institutions in the world greater emphasis is being laid on the interdisciplinarity and the you know at the cross disciplines possibilities of new discoveries are higher so we are providing much greater emphasis on those areas and we have also activities strong activity in material science and uh, you know another strong point of this institution that we have many young people below the age of 40 who are there they have come from some of the very best places of the world so i think it all augurs well for this institution in the years to come it's a it's a very important point uh, most of our audience are very young people who are looking at you know opportunities for uh, doing research perhaps what's this institution offers to young students well we we actually provide lot of incentive to the students for instance you know we have started now integrated phd program in all areas of science and we are providing scholarship which is higher than many of the other institutions and but here very limited number of seats available of, of course the competition is very intense nevertheless some of the very best students we can attract and our idea is to attract nationally and we have started this recently in you know since we are not a degree granting institutions it is our endeavor that we would become a, you know a deemed university in near future. near future but until then you know we have received lot of interest from other institutes such as iit iit kharagpur and indian association for the cultivation of science we have started a program in chemical biology uh, which is again a very frontier area of biology where lot of developments are taking place the worldwide that's that's a that's a interesting uh, snapshot of the history of this institute and what this institute is now we'll take a very short break welcome back to eureka we are having a very very interesting conversation with professor santanu bhattacharya who is the director of indian association for cultivation of science 
if I ask you, like, what are the three major areas that you have worked on? What would you put as your top three? Well, my interests are at the cross disciplines of biology and chemistry, okay. and chemistry and material science and physics. And, uh, you know, we are interested in, for example, soft matter. And soft matter, soft condensed matter is a very important field. But I think we need to understand many things of it, physics of it, chemistry of it, biology of it, so that you can apply this for various kinds of applications which are of value to the society. And so we actually make non-polymeric, in most general way, small molecular gels by design and synthesis. And after we make them, we actually solubilize them in certain kind of solvents. And if it forms a gel, this immobilizes the solvent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then even if you invert the container, it will not flow under the influence of gravity. So they are so-called non-Newtonian fluids. And we utilize them because they could be used for drug delivery. They could be used for encapsulation of pheromones for sustained release, which you can use in pest-free agriculture. Mm -hmm. And there are various other possibilities. Uh, just sir, just uh, you said something very interesting. You said that uh, this gels perhaps can be used uh, in uh, pesticide-free agriculture. Yes. How do you actually do that? Actually, what we do, we entrap a pheromone. Okay. And the kinetics of its release can be controlled in such materials in such a way that even in, you know, ambient conditions of very high summer uh, or even in rainy season, this, there is no leaching of pheromone and this pheromone provides a much higher concentration for the insects to sense it and it provides a disorder mechanism to their meet, mating. Okay. And once you, you know, run havoc in that process, automatically, you know, pests uh, can be actually kept confined in, uh, you know, in a small region, in a small re region around that pheromone trap and they don't go and invade fruits as fruit flies. So that's one trick. Actually, we have done this in many orchards. The pheromones are basically chemicals released by uh, either the male or the female. Natural. To attract the yes. opposite uh, sex. Natural the attractant. Pest, right? huh? Yeah, uh -huh. sex attractant. So basically, this uh, artificial uh, release of pheromone will bring the uh, pest to this place. Yes. And it won't actually fly into the farm in an uh, orchard or a... Uh, Field. That's, that's, that's right. How... And there is no contamination. You are not uh -huh. spraying any yeah. uh -huh. pesticide. So this will actually help the general population and agricultural workers in a very big way. Because there is absolutely, you know, all you need to do, you just put it hanging in a tree, in a very small vial, and I think it will attract the flies there and will be confined there. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, you also work on uh, the DNA structures which are very different from uh, the Watson Creek. Uh, yeah, actually actual. we, we work on, you know, non-canonical secondary structures of nucleic acids, which are typically, you know, G quadruplex DNA. Science book, for example, a school science book. Right. It says that uh, the whole DNA is uh, nothing but... Uh, Watson Creek based, double yeah, helical like structure. A, you know, ladder which is kind of twisted and made into a spiral. That's right. That's the Watson Creek double helical yeah. structure. You know, 1962, it was recognized by the Nobel Prize. All of us know, all of our children know from their high school textbooks. But I think they, they are thermodynamically most stable form of DNA. But a lot of things happen during, you know, meiosis and various other cellular events where DNA and, or other forms of nucleic acid undergo various kinds of structural transition at the secondary structural level. Okay. And those are very interesting targets for various kinds of degenerative diseases. If you can actually control and put them in some kind of a form like that, then you so can control... what you are trying to say is... Aging that, or, you know, even cancer, carcinogenesis. So you can target small molecules which can stabilize some of these structures. So, but what you are saying is that the whole DNA is not actually in that structure. There may be small parts where which have a different kind That's of structure. That's right. There are, you know, holiday junction and various other kinds of special segments of DNA where you can actually such kind of structures are formed. And these are non, 
Watson Creek based. But why do you say these structures are important for, let's say, uh, uh, doing some work on anti-aging or slowing the aging? Why do you say that these structures are important? Because these are intimately connected with something called telomere biology. And you know, if you can control the activity of telomerase, you can actually control your clock of aging. Okay. That's the, actually, in, at the cellular level, this has been demonstrated. But it's far greater challenge is to implement that in a mammalian system. So we are working towards making small molecules. These molecules would bind and preferentially stabilize these kind of structures, which would eventually lead to, uh, you know, disruption of telomerase activity. That's the idea. This, uh, this I think, has a very interesting point. For example, uh, if you look at uh, the average life expectancy in India at the time of independence, it was around 37. Today, it's about 63 plus. Some parts of India, like Kerala, it's 70 plus. Right. Soon, we are going to have a population, maybe in another 20 years or 30 years, the average age might become something like about 80, 85. So, it is not enough that you live longer, but longer you should be able to be younger. Right? So, that's where the anti-aging becomes yes. very important. You can give a quality of life. So, actually, if you can manage your life better, that is important. Yeah. That's the target today. You know, most of the societies we are now wit witnessing number of increasing number of centenarians yeah and that is a trait which is happening but we have to also keep these people walking yeah. mentally active they can contribute to the society as a matter of fact there is a uh, recent paper which suggests that by the year 2050 two thirds of the people will be above 65 years old Two-thirds of the world population will be above 65 years. Yes. And, you know, 0 to 14 years of age, there's the, you know, young kids and infants, they will be a very small minority. So this is something we have to worry about. Actually, we have to, you know, condition our system so that increasingly we can effectively use our aging population. So they have to be kept in a mentally alert, with a functional brain and maximal physical capacity. So this is the challenge uh, in front of us today. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting point. Once upon a time, the challenge is not to make people die young. Yes. You know, like Ramanujam. Right. Died very young of, uh, I mean, avoidable perhaps, avoidable death. Yeah, tuberculosis. People, yeah, the people died of uh, various stuff in very, very young age. Absolutely. We have solved that. So now we have to look at the other end of the spectrum. That other is when end you of are the spectrum. Older still, how can you be young? Yes, but we have new challenges. For example, you know, all of our existing antibiotics are becoming drug resistant. Mm -hmm. So this is where actually we have huge amount of opportunity to work on. For the young aspiring scientists, I think this is a very important fertile area where we should discover new molecules as new generation antibiotics, which will actually traverse a completely different pathway to act as antibiotic. Very, very interesting. On this note, we'll take a very short break. Welcome back to Eureka. And we are having a very, very interesting conversation with Professor Santanu Bhattacharya, who is the director of Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. You have been working on uh, attacking cancer. Yes. And uh, if you look at uh, in uh, soon, people say that that's going to be the number one killer. Even in some developed countries, it's the number one killer. In India, maybe it's in the top three, four. It's not still uh, first, but uh, soon, once you, uh, you know, overcome all the infectious diseases, death due to infectious diseases, perhaps cancer is going to be the number one killer. Yeah, as life expectancy goes up, incidences of cancer formation increases. And Basically, also, cancer is a disease of age, right? Except few except exceptions. Higher frequency for the aging people, because it's, you know, there are increasing propensity of mutation uh, once aging takes place. And many mutations lead to irreparable loss in the function. And there you have carcinogenesis, cancer formation, tumorigenesis, and so on and so forth. Now, we have another approach which we have undertaken. We try to develop molecular footprints for gene therapeutic systems. Gene therapy is a very attractive field in which gene is used 
as therapeutics. Okay. Uh -huh. So many of the disorders like cancer, which are based on genetic mutations, they are actually you supplement aberrant gene with the correct gene. But it is a very difficult task to deliver the gene. So in order to deliver the gene, one of the most difficult thing to accomplish is to find out a carrier. Mother Nature makes it through virus. But you know, this has been tried in 80s in the United States and in elsewhere, and even 90s. And this failed because, you know, when you use virus, even dead virus, dead adenovirus, for example, there is a risk of high immunogenic allergic reaction. And that leads to death on the patient. So in clinical setting, it failed. So there, you can actually make molecules by chemical design. These molecules should bind with nucleic acid or gene, and then you can make it deliver across the cell. And there it becomes very interesting because once it goes across the cell and then it gets expressed, then it gives you the function which you are missing because of the disease state. So that's supplementation. So, but delivery is the key issue where we are working in a big way. And we are working with, you know, different types of immune compromised mice, and there we have actually delivered a, such kind of delivery matrix and we have shown that tumor regression to a significant extent it is possible. That, that, that's a very interesting. Uh, I'm also told that uh, you worked in the lab of uh, Hargobind Kurana, an Indian origin Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, scientist when you were, were in US. Can you tell us something about your experience there? What was your uh, interaction with him? We will be suddenly very interested. I can only tell you, you know, I still remember the day my supervisor, uh, you know, PhD supervisor came to me and told me that I just got a call, call from Hargobind Khurana and he wants to take a personal interview of you for which you have to travel to MIT. Okay. So I was very excited dates were announced and I was asked to give a seminar and he asked many questions and he asked me to intermingle with many postdocs. It's one of the largest group in MIT. I had interaction and after interaction at the end of the day he told me you should be thinking about a problem which you have to propose and it has to be funded from some of the private agencies in the United States. So I realized that I have been chosen for getting a postdoctoral position. In subsequent years, after submitting my thesis, I went there and it was actually a dream come true. It is a very multidisciplinary lab where people of various kinds of expertise work together. And Professor Khurana was interacting with us almost on an hourly basis. And even in weekends he used to come. And mind that I have gone there, this is two decades after he won Nobel Prize. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, for his discovery of, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the, co the genetic code elements through synthetic organic chemistry. And uh, that time he was working on a very frontier problem involving membrane proteins. Mm -hmm. And membrane proteins, you know, working in membrane proteins were far more ch challenging than soluble globular proteins. And he was one, among the first people who actually developed methodology how to work with membrane proteins. And I was given to work with rhodopsin. Okay. And I learned protein chemistry and molecular biology there. I was originally trained as an organic chemist and a physical organic chemist and uh, molecular designer. So I combined that training with this molecular biology and that helped me to develop chemical biology. Uh, you know, uh, as a practicing right. chemical biologist of the country. That, that's an interesting point. Uh, let me ask you a very different question. We don't have much time, we are at the end of the program, but then I want to ask you this question very importantly. You have been a teacher of a higher education institute for more than 25 years. Okay, I mean if you look at the statistics, if there are 10,000 workforce, in China roughly about 11 belong to science and technology. The science and technology will start from, you know, your lab technician in a uh, hospital who tests your blood 
to uh, you know a scientist who may be sending a rocket so low know? end to the highest end low end. everything yeah. put together is about 11 per 10000 in us it's about 68 and in india it's just 4 if we want to become a modern nation if we want to leap frog to uh, future i think with this number has to grow Absolutely. what do you think we need to do i think you know we have 1.3 billion population and soon we are going to be numero uno in terms of the population the statistics tell you that there are lot of untapped untapped talents all across the country so we have to have very good reach out mechanism we have to go to actually interior places all around the country and we have to disseminate science education in the best possible way we need dedicated teachers at the same time we also need live demonstration of science which will entice the younger generation you know even if you do magic shows involving science yeah mm. if you can use you know some some of the you know classroom physics experiments that will actually excite lot of people you can do experiments demonstrating in computer so that they see and explain some of these things will go a long way in bringing out untapped talent because of the change in the society value system and whatever i think number of dedicated teachers are dwindling all the time and that is something a worrisome trend so we have to actually recognize teaching from school level all the way to the highest level and very good pedagogy is required so that you can reach out to this population who are untapped and they will come and we have i am pretty convinced that such talented people are there out there we have to we have to tap them we have to tap them thank you that's a very interesting point lastly most of our viewers are young people what would be your message to this young india i would like to tell that you know you would like to choose a job that you like so once you know you have chosen a profession or job which you like then it's not any more than work for you that's a that's a very interesting note to end this conversation cv raman who worked in this institute and his work in this institute is what fetched him his nobel prize he famously said science is the highest form of creative art yes science is creative it is not just mugging up something from your textbook that's a key message i think we should take from this uh, episode of eureka keep watching eureka in the next episode we will come with a conversation with another scientist thank you sir thank you for being with us we enjoyed the show really very well thank you thank you very much